WDBM East Lansing. Welcome to The Sci-Files, an Impact 89 FM series focusing on student research here at Michigan State University. We're your co-hosts Chelsea Boudou and Daniel Puentes. Today on The Sci-Files, we're joined by David Butts. David, can you please introduce yourself? Uh, hi, I'm David, and I'm a second year PhD student in the Computational Mathematics, Science, and Engineering Department here at Michigan State. I model animal movement and evacuations of cities using a technique called agent-based modeling. Are you studying any particular types of animals or just animal movement in general? Uh, I study the movement of deer right now with an application to chronic wasting disease, which is a disease in deer where they get this prion, which is a type of misfolded protein that will replicate inside of them a lot. And when they get this, they slowly kind of waste away. You might have heard them as like zombie deer in the news lately. Um, when deer are eating in the environment, they leave saliva behind, which can carry this prion. They pass feces into the environment, and when they die, their bodies are full of this prion that will be left behind for other deer to possibly uptake when they're eating around that area. It sounds like this misfolded protein can be moved around a lot. Is it contractable by other types of animals in the local environment? As far as I'm aware, um, I'm not actually sure. My expertise is not in this prion, but... For other deer to uptake it, uh, they can, and it will infect them with 100% um, or 100 of the time. Uh, other animals, if they eat it, like humans, for example, won't get this disease as of right now, but other similar types exist like bad cow disease um, or scrabies in sheep. So, David, at the beginning of this episode, you mentioned that you're in the CMSE program, which is the Computational Mathematics, Science, and Engineering program here at MSU. And you told us that one of your focuses in your project is to look at the deer with the chronic wasting disease. I'm wondering, how do you incorporate this agent-based modeling with the deer? Do you use data sets that are already out there, or do you um, model what happens in your own way, or do you see the, the deer here in Michigan and kind of like track them and stuff? So we have a collaboration with some scientists in the Fisheries and Wildlife Department, and they actually have data where they tag deer with GPS collars and ping them for a year uh, at uh, four or five hour intervals. So I have a data set of approximately 100 deer that have been tagged in that study. For the state of Michigan, that's a relatively small size for the number of deer in your population there. Is there a particular reason why you're working with a small sample size? Is there a limit to this agent-based modeling theory? And why did you choose this? Uh, there's not a limit in the modeling aspect. It's more of money for people to go out and catch deer and tag them and you know hunting season happens and deer that are tagged can be killed deer run into roads and can be killed so i don't exactly know how many they tag at a time but a hundred that survived you know the tagging process i'm curious what area of michigan are the deer that your data set are located in and also what can you do with this data set? Like, what is the end goal of your project? So I have uh, deer from two regions. Uh, one's from northern Michigan, and the other is from actually New York. Uh, we're not too worried about the geographical difference. Uh, we're hoping that we're going to be using some landscape information in these models, so which will hopefully subtract out the uh, specific state that the uh, deer are coming from. It also helps that they're probably also around the same latitude as well. Yeah, and you know, there's no mountains in the way. Like if I had Colorado deer versus Michigan deer, you know, probably New York and Michigan are fairly similar as far as where deer are living. With this data set, we want to train a movement model and a disease model. Since the disease is passed into the environment by deer moving around, uh, it's very important to know where the deer are physically. But also, we have information about the landscapes. So. I know where food, water, and shelter for a deer are, and we're going to try and subtract out that information from our model. So a place that, like Colorado would have a good chance at using this model also, even though we've trained it on deer from Michigan and New York. Within agent-based modeling, there are certain things that you can take into account, such as parameters and attributes within your model. What are some parameters and attributes that your stakeholders might be interested in, in later whenever the model is complete? So since I'm modeling all the deer as individuals in this model, uh, you'll have a good representation of what deer in Michigan are doing, and you can try these what-if sorts of models, like 
what if I call a bunch of deer in a radius? Or what if I extend hunting season? Um, and it gives you a playground to kind of try these things and test them out without you know, taking the time, money, and effort to physically do it in the real world and possibly make the wrong choice. Well, it's great that different organizations are taking an interest in how agent-based modeling can be used to apply to different problems that they're trying to solve. One big example is something that you talked about earlier in the beginning of this interview in regards to city evacuations. Recently, we've observed a number of different natural disasters occurring throughout the planet Earth, one of them being the Australian wildfires that have been taking the whole continent by a stranglehold. How can agent-based modeling be used in the city evacuations that can help with different things like evacuating towns in Australia? Over the summers, I spend uh, my time at Los Alamos National Labs, and we build models for this exact thing. We can create a city by downloading where all the roads are and all the buildings, and we can populate it with a synthetic population. So right now, our main focus has been on traffic. We're looking at what routes are the best, where congestion you know, will start happening, and what we can do to you know, inform people to you know, drive in certain ways or how, how the best way that they can evacuate a city. Right, like how they have evacuation routes whenever there's a hurricane coming to South Florida, for example. Exactly. But when there's a hurricane, you don't want to be testing your evacuation routes at that time. You would like to have some sort of sandbox that you could say, would it be better if we take option one or option two? We're trying to provide that sort of capability to cities to plan ahead for these sorts of events. So going off of Danny's example, I myself am a Floridian, and I know that whenever there is a natural disaster occurring, that there can be things like trees falling down and stuff like that. So what happens if the turnpike or some road or something is closed off? Can your agent-based modeling take that into account and be able to accommodate for the changes in the road and closed-off areas? Uh, yes. So we download network Yes, uh, we download road network data, and we actually will build the entire road network of whatever city we want. And for example, if a tree falls or if there's a fire or whatever, we can just delete that road from the network and see how the agents in the simulation will react to it. That's wonderful that your agent-based model is able to take all of these different things into account. But how quickly does it take to work? For example, I know that some codes may take hours to run. And what happens if it's something like an earthquake or a tsunami coming that's very rapid and you need to evacuate these people right away? So right now, our models are going to be more of a practice run, not a live action sort of code. Uh, so last summer, we were running simulations of Los Alamos, which has around 20,000 people in it. And I could run that model about 100 times and it would take five hours uh, to get some results for one strategy. Right now, they've all been about the same, but one issue with the Los Alamos road network is there's one exit road out of Los Alamos. So when things start piling up, the congestion all happens in one area. So small changes to the network, like opening up back roads and things like that, haven't really been effective. What about an island like Puerto Rico that could be hit with earthquakes? Do you take boats into account or something like that? Because if you're on an island, there's only so far you can go. Right now, no. It's only been road, uh, road networks, and we've been mostly focused on you know, the lower 48 states and kind of bigger cities that, where we consider evacuation being out of the main part of the city. To tie it all together, you're studying how animal movement can be modeled just like traffic can be modeled through city evacuations under this agent-based modeling. What makes it so advantageous towards what other people are doing to try and study these types of systems? So in the application of traffic, a lot of people like to model it as if it were a fluid or, you know, write some sort of equation down they could solve uh, instead of modeling all the individuals. It's faster. Uh, but the problem is, is you lose all that individual behavior and characteristics. So I can put drivers on the road that are angry drivers, and I can put them in with different amounts of gas in their car or whatever sort of attribute you think is important, which will be completely looked over in any sort of equation-based model. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and with the deer project, uh, once again, it's very important to know how the individual deers are moving around. So they're passing this disease into the environment. 
and I need to know exactly where deer have and haven't been. If I treat the deer more of like a super deer or some entity that's moving across the landscape, I won't have a good idea of where a specific infected deer may have gone, but instead just the entire population may have gone over here. So, David, what motivated you to do research in CMSC? So I actually did my undergraduate here at Michigan State in physics. Um, and when I was a junior, I was looking for some undergrad research positions. And I found a new professor, Professor Murillo, in the CMSC department and started working with him as an undergraduate. Does your project differ at all between what you did as an undergraduate compared to now? Yeah, uh, we actually started out with doing flu modeling, uh, still agent-based modeling, but a different application. And recently we have found these collaborations uh, with the Fishery and Wildlife Department, and they have real data for us. So we've been kind of more towards that project. Cool. I think it's really great that you're doing collaboration across the campus within different departments. Since you're interacting with different people, are you involved with any other things in the campus? So other than the collaborations I have on campus, uh, the CMSE department has multiple sports teams, and I am president of the CMSE Graduate Student Organization, which we participate in the Science Festival every year. Uh, this year, we'll have some VR equipment set up to look at simulations. Uh, we have a game that you can play in a simulation that will update as you move around, and we usually have a 3D printer set up as well. That sounds like a really nice event that the CMSE Graduate Student Organization is putting together. Thank you so much for joining us today to talk to us about your research in the CMSC department. Thank you. Hey, do you want to drink some beer brewed by scientists while playing arcade games? Then join us at the first anniversary of the Sci-Files at the Grid on Pi Day. At 6 p.m., we will be releasing a beer brewed at Sagatug Brewery called Diceros. The proceeds go to the black rhino mother, Dopsy, and her calf, Jali, from Potter Park Zoo at the Animal Health Program. It's going to be epic. You're going to get to hear interviewees from the Sci-Files give updates on their episodes, such as the doctors and zookeepers of the Black Rhinos. It's almost been a year of the Sci-Files. To celebrate the anniversary, we will be giving out prizes, too. See you at the Grid on March 14th, also known as Pi Day. <laughs>